And thank you everyone for joining us today for our GTM Talks Plankton Monitoring Webinar. We have three exciting presenters um, who have joined us today to share more about the phytoplankton monitoring network, how the GTM Research Reserve monitors for plankton, and a new exciting opportunity that we have to learn more about our plankton. Today's webinar is a part of a larger webinar series called GTM Talks which features education, research, monitoring, and stewardship efforts here at the GTM Research Reserve through presentations from our reserve citizen scientists, visiting scientists, and staff. Um, within the week, today's webinar will be uploaded to the Friends of the GTM Reserve website, which is www.gtmnerr.org, where you can revisit today's webinar and view previous GTM Talks webinars. My name is Caitlin Dietz, and I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the GTM Research Reserve. Also on our webinar today are Abby Kuhn and Brittany Wessick, who will be facilitating our question and answer sessions following today's presentations. They're also on to help with any technology questions. So feel free to private message them in the chat box function that Abby shared earlier if you need anything at all, um, and they'll help walk through what's happening on Zoom for you. We also encourage you to share any questions that you have for our presenters in the chat box, and we'll be sure to get those questions answered during the question and answer time. It helps get the questions out of your head and on paper or virtual paper, so that way you can focus on the rest of the presentation and not wonder if you're going to forget that question by the time this Q&A session comes along. Um, while I introduce our first two presenters today, I would love to see who all has joined us. So if you are able to find that chat box that Abby shared earlier, please type in there um, your name, where you're joining us in from, whether you are local here in the GTM Research Reserve area, or if you're tuning in from another part of Florida or another part of the country, we'd love to see where you're coming from. And then what about today's webinar sparked your interest? Are you interested in phytoplankton monitoring? Are you interested in all of the exciting research happening at the reserve? Are you a volunteer? who helps out with some of our research and monitoring projects. Um, just share with us what's so interesting and exciting about plankton monitoring to you. And while you are all sharing with us in the chat box who you are and what's so exciting about plankton, um, I will go ahead and introduce our first presenter. Our first presenter is Doc, or John Whiteley, and he is a citizen science volunteer at the GTM Research Reserve. John is a native Floridian with an exciting background, including being an electronic weapon system mechanic with the Air Force, an air traffic controller at Jacksonville International, and a contract account manager with Whirlpool. He enjoys nature and landscape photography, traveling, tennis, golf, and cycling. And when we asked him why he enjoys volunteering with the phytoplankton monitoring program, um, John shared that it's important to our planet's health and to us, its inhabitants. And he has the time and energy to volunteer and do the, his part while working with such nice staff <laughs> and volunteers. And I did not say that, he told me that. So I'm not making that up. And then after John shares about the phytoplankton monitoring network, um, Paige Priester will also give a presentation. And Paige Priester is a citizen science volunteer at the GTM Research Reserve as well. And Paige is also a native Floridian who has a passion for plankton and microplastics. Since her first time observing phytoplankton at the GTM, she was fascinated at what was living in a drop of water. How many times have you guys thought about what lives in a single drop of water? Well, Paige does it all the time. 
She was amazed that something so small could be so vital to life. And it's been eight years since she first started volunteering with the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network. And Paige shared that every time she looks at a water sample, she is always astonished that there is something new to observe. So we are excited to go ahead and get started on our series of presentations. And I would like to ask John to go ahead and share your computer screen and kick us off. I'm going to unmute, share my screen, turn off this monitor. And OK, everybody see that phytoplankton? Yes, we can. Okay, here we go. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, Paige and I are very happy to be here and to share a little bit about what we're doing here. So, uh, what is phytoplankton or PMN as we uh, refer to it? And I'm just going to quickly go through some slides and kind of give you an idea of what we do nationally and also what we're doing here locally. So, we'll, I'm going to page down. So what are HABs, harmful algal blooms? Uh, they're I mean, one of two types of blooms we see, the harmful ones and the benign ones. And so just the, these four photos here give you an example of what they look like from the air. And uh, what we're trying to do is find out where they are and uh, what kind of more organisms would create those. So what are algae? Well, algae is a, uh, it's a photosynthetic plant-like organism and they're all over the world. Fresh water and marine is primarily what we're interested in and here at uh, GTM being on the coast <clears throat> we're interested more in the marine aspects of it which is basically uh, saltwater, oceans, bays, and uh, brackish waters like we get in the intercoastal waterway. So the next slide uh, blooms can form uh, because of a number of different things, uh, changes in light intensity, uh, runoff from uh, lawns and uh, cities and towns and things, uh, and, and other elements you can see there listed. So when we say harmful, what do we mean by harmful uh, algae? They can cause a, a number of different things, physical damage to fish, uh, they can also take it and remove the oxygen from the water, which will kill fish, and you can see that middle photo on the right. And also they can harm not only marine animals, such as the dolphin here pictured, but humans as well. And we've broken down primarily uh, the phyto phytoplankton that we're interested in can be broken down into three groups, dinoflagellates, diatoms and cyanobacteria. Uh, Paige will get a lot more in depth on these types and uh, gives a, a better understanding of these various types. Uh, some of the things that uh, uh, we, we can get uh, from these things, what kind of illnesses and everything, uh, you'll see them listed by a category there, but it, it can be bad news for not only humans, but fish and other animals. So what is our mission here at uh, PMN? Well, to educate the public on HGVs and to expand their knowledge of it and, uh, and actually to demonstrate uh, the relationship between us and our coastal areas, such as our estuaries that we have around here. This kind of gives you a broad overview of how many places in the country, and tell you, keep in mind this photo is, our representation is about 10 years old. Um, this is the number of sampling sites. You'll see the yellow dots, mostly on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast and a few up in the Seattle area, where you've got many volunteers. In this case, we had over 100 at the time, sampling more than 100 different sites and uh, taking many, many different measurements, up to 130,000 data points. So it's a big program at a national level. Some of the sites that uh, have shown to have toxic blooms were uh, the upper left uh, picture there, you'll see Alaska. Looks like they found some catastrophes there. 
and down in the Texas coast there, that's a dinophysis and, and uh, others are other organisms you'll see there. So they have happened at times. Now in Florida, most everybody is familiar with the one that gets the most attention, at least in the media, and that's the red tide. And Paige uh, may or may not mention which organism causes that, but obviously red tides are not good. They can make people sick and uh, ruin the tourist industry. If you've ever been around uh, part of the, uh, the state that has had a, an outbreak. This photo is just kind of demonstrating a little bit about what we do uh, in a local PMS. We're doing some volunteer training here on the left. Uh, these volunteers are learning how to do a net tow to collect the samples. And on the right, there's a classroom setting of what uh, it may look like uh, all across the country, people sitting down in front of microscopes. Now, basically, the sampling that we do is broken down into four different steps. So the first one is actually going out into the field, doing the sampling in the tow, and the tow is basically a, a net that collects everything into a funnel-like, and then at the bottom of that is a uh, model that we use to collect it and we cap it and then bring it back into the labs. We're not doing step two right now unless we did see something that really is setting up a red flag. We normally would collect uh, at the same time we're doing the tow and making some other measurements, uh, water temperature, salinity. We're uh, collecting in a smaller bottle samples to bring back with us. And that's a preemptive thing that allows us to, if we find something in the lab in step three, that needs the attention of our biologists and, and other people, then we've already got the sample in head. We don't have to go back out to the same site to do it all over again. And then in step four, if it is something that needs to be looked at by other people, such as our, our main PMN lab in Charleston, South Carolina, then uh, we'll send them the bottle and they'll take a look at it. So after we've done all that, we're going to hold the back and forth between this form the next one so we're we're use <clears throat> we use this form which i think is used across the country to make recordings uh list the identify the site such as in this case you can see the sampling site was going to lake here at gtm uh i've dated it today Paige would uh, fill out her name and everything the sample time record the water temperature the water salinity and so forth um and then in the bottom left hand part of that we're actually making uh writing down what kind of weather we had and things like that very much in pressure so <clears throat> going back then we would go into noah's website and we would upload this information uh once we pulled in or log into the the right region uh, in this case it would be the uh, Atlantic region number three and the Florida East Coast. And we would actually find, in this case, maybe Guana Lake or Guana River listed. We would uh, identify as the, the uh, or origin or the source of this particular sample. So you can see on the right under target species screening, those are the targets that we are most interested in that we're most likely to find here in Florida or in Northeast Florida, as you can see will indicate whether we saw any of those or not and if we did is it uh one or two uh, uh, species that we saw or under elevated was it what we would call the bloom and if it is we would record that and then at the bottom there we list other types of uh, organisms uh, just to get a broad uh, overview of what we saw so we send in the samples if we have to uh, twice, twice a month. And uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're cataloging them by these uh, icons right here. Red one, which would mean that we need to send that in by next year. Otherwise we would send it by UPS. And there's our schedule that we have uh, currently uh, we would be the blue area you see there. We would say that it looks like once a month now. Uh, and actually, it's, it's bi-monthly. Every other month, we send it in. But right now, all that's been suspended because of the COVID. So we're 
sort of in a, uh, a much uh, smaller situation. Here we have some photos of some local people that are doing a couple of the different tasks. Uh, Joe is on the left-hand photo. And he's uh, making the tow with his net. And then we do a three-minute tow and a racetrack sort of pattern. At the end of that, then he would lift up and then funnel it down into the bottle and cap it. On the right, he's doing something called a Secchi dish where we're measuring the opacity. And then Meredith is here doing the uh, wind uh, speed and the outside temperature with the anemometer. And on the right, she's looking at a uh, salinity uh, measuring device. She's dropping some samples and here she's actually looking through, it, it's almost like a, a telescope, but you're looking at uh, the reading. And then what she would do after that is record it. And the last slide here is an example of uh, our typical lab setting, which everybody can guess now is not normally this, this with the pandemic situation. So, but normally we would have a, in this case, a GTM, we have a classroom set up and everybody's sitting around and collaborating. And we might have, Nikki is in the black shirt here standing, our uh, biologist, and we might call her over and say, hey, Nikki, I don't, uh, recognize this particular my uh, phytoplankton can you identify it for us and of course she immediately pulls it up just like that so oh, yeah that's a catastrophe or pseudo or whatever but anyway we have a good time uh this is all um, things that we'd love to do it's enjoyable we feel like we're uh contributing to you know our in our small way to contribute to the planet health and safety and uh so but um, what you may ask, well, what are we doing now? Well, right now, um, it's mainly up to uh, Paige and I. We're working out of our respective homes, and we got a little lab set up with a microscope, and we're doing all this. We go out and do the sample, bring it back in, look at it, record it, um, and then upload that to NOAA. So it's a, it's a skeleton crew we've got going on right now, but we can't wait until we get back to that setting that you're looking at there. Um, Caitlin, that's pretty much my presentation. That's great. Thank you so much, John. Okay. And I'll stop screen sharing, right? Yes, please. And then Paige, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, and then we'll have time after the presentations for questions and answers for John and Paige. Um, so feel free to add any of those questions that you might have into the chat box. Okay, am I on? You are. Okay, thank you, John. I um, miss being in that classroom setting very much. Um, let me go back to the beginning of my, hold on. There we go. <laughs> it's the beginning of my presentation. It's nice also to see um, some fam familiar faces when you guys were first logging on. And um, you did a great job, John, explaining what we do in PMN. Um, Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, and that is mostly a program that um, is a citizen science group, like John was explaining at the GTM, that we are um, looking for potential harmful blooms. But after volunteering for many years, um, I realized there's a lot more to um, phytoplankton than just blooms. When I, that was actually my first program that I started off participating as a volunteer at the GTM. And the only thing I knew before I started that program was just a little bit about phytoplankton and it basically had to do with harmful blooms and that's all I knew. Um, this photo here is a picture of um, some, a water sample I took right outside of the GTM on the beach so that I could get some pretty pictures for you guys today. And this is a live sample. So some phytoplankton basics. Um, once I had been volunteering for a couple years, I realized there was a lot more to phytoplankton 
than just a phytoplankton bloom. And that's what I found so um, fascinating and amazing about phytoplankton is that they provide 50% or more, some biologists believe that that's a little bit more of the oxygen that we breathe on the earth um, that's vital to sustaining life. And it also kind of blew me away that terrestrial plants get all the credit for providing oxygen that we breathe on the planet when really they are these little small little organisms living in the water. Not only are they beautiful, but they're providing the oxygen that we need to sustain life. Also, um, they are the basis of the aquatic food web. They're, um, we have to have them or we wouldn't have any fish in the sea and it would move right on up to, um, to the food chain. Um, something else I found very interesting when I was first learning about phytoplankton is it's a constantly changing environment. Um, you don't just tow a sample one day and see a certain species and then go expect to tow even a couple hours later or the next day and see the same thing. It's a rapidly changing environment depending on the water temperature, the salinity, that's how much salt is in the water versus fresh water, nutrients in the water like nitrogen and phosphate, and also light availability. Um, how much on a darker day, how much light is, or a cloudy day, how much um, light is getting down into the water column. So um, after a few years of volunteering with um, phytoplankton monitoring not network, and I was very excited about learning all the different species, and there's 5,000 of them. So I figured that'll keep me busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> I only know a few of them. But um, our research director, Dr. Nikki Dix, asked me if I would like to participate in the GTM long-term monitoring water net, um, research. And um, she needed someone to do cell counts. Um, they didn't have enough people on biologists on staff to do this. So I started counting samples for her within the last few years. Um, since the COVID, I have um, moved my lab at home and let me see if my little air works. This is a picture of my at-home lab cleaned up for, my, for you guys. And then this is the microscope I work on with my samples here. This is an inverted microscope versus a traditional light microscope that we use in phytoplankton monitoring. And if you notice, the objectives are here on the bottom. And I'll explain to you um, the difference of that a little more. Um, I'm keeping up four sites currently within the GTM um, research, uh, Guana River, Guana Lake, Pellissier Creek, and Fort Matanzas. Um, so I wanted to show you a little picture here on the left. I hope, is my error working, Caitlin? Okay, so this is some instruments I use to um, prepare my water samples. And this measures out the exact amount of water that I'm gonna be looking at my phytoplankton sample. I put it into a settling chamber. And because I'm using an inverted microscope versus a light microscope slide, I'm looking at the sample from the bottom. So if I me measure out a milliliter of water, then I want that sample to sit so that cells go down to the bottom of the sample and I can do a cell count of that particular um, sample. This is my little counter and I have a camera set up where I can take pictures to it. And this is a picture um, on the right that is from Guana Lake recently. And you can see by the numerous of um, cells in this sample that I would need a, a counter to count this. So I'm actually counting each individual cell. This is a very dense sample. And um, most of this, um, these species are freshwater species, which we do not see in our marine coastal areas. We would only see these in sites like uh, Guana Lake, uh, a couple miles north of the dam, where the salinity of the water would be a lot lower. And so then we would traditionally see these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on freshwater because we're mostly looking at marine species. So. A more typical um, marine species, our type of uh, phytoplankton we see are diatoms. Diatoms 
Bats um, are very abundant in, in the estuary and also the coastal waterways. And this beautiful picture, if you have participated in phytoplankton monitoring network, you would learn this one. This is one of the first ones we learned to identify. This is a cosina discus. It's just beautiful to me. And uh, most of the time, um, it's often referred to as algae or um, it's basically algae living in little glass houses because the outer shell is made out of silica. And then the inside are um, pigments and this, this is where the photosynthesizing is taking place that's similar to plants. Notice they're golden brown and that's the different pigments than you would have in your more traditional, um, like you would think green and plants as the chlorophyll. Um, phytoplank um, phytoplankton diatoms are divided up into two groups. The first group are um, centric diatoms and these species that you see on the screen these are all very common. If you participated in PMN, you probably can ad identify a few of these. Um, centric diatoms, don't move on your slide. They're normally a little larger than some other um, phytoplankton, so they're relatively pretty easy to um, identify some of the common ones. The one here on the left is skeletonema, and it looks like a little ladder. And these are individual cells that um, tend to form chains. And in phytoplankton monitoring network, like John was saying, we're looking for particular species that are potentially harmful, but we're also seeing these phytoplankton that are not considered harmful. And then we're trying to qualify what are we seeing. So that's what we do in PMN. We'll say, oh, we see a skeletonemia. And then we say it's present or elevated or we have a bloom. So, but the difference in the research counting I'm doing is I'm counting each individual cell. So I'm quantifying our samples so that um, Nikki can get a, a better idea of the density uh, and which species am I seeing in the water samples and within the research um, water samples. This is another centric diatom, Grenardia. It's, um, it tends to form chains as well. It can, you can see it as a single cell, but you more often see it um, chained up. It's very interesting if you look at the chlorophyll um, patterns inside of this, this is um, a helpful way that we use to identify different uh, species. And you can kind of see the difference here. This is an Odentella and there's more, uh, you can see more chlorophylls in there, and you can also see it's completely shaped different. So these are things that we use to identify to uh, species level. And again, these, these can more often are seen single cell, but they can join together like this and form really pretty patterns. This is um, Perilia, and you normally would see this in a chain. And then we have uh, Helicotheca, which makes this beautiful pattern. And those are very easy in PMN or in research to identify those types of plankton. Um, all of these plankton are not bad. They are um, very vital to our um, environment. So these are a good thing, and they're also very pretty to look at. Uh, the other type of diatom that's very common that we see in all of our samples are the pinnates. Pinnates are very similar. They have the silica shell around them. And they also, you can see the different patterns of the chlorophyll to identify them. Um, this is a denilum. It's um, quite larger than some of the other species and it's easy to identify. The next one here is a navicula. And these do have a small capability to move. Um, if you've participated in PMN, you'll often see them sliding back and forth on your slide. And they release a little fluid on the bottom of, of them, and that helps them kind of slide back and forth. Um, these tend to live throughout the water column. Um, they do go to the sediment, and that's where they would have the moving 
and it's very small. So mostly they're like the centrics. They're just free and drifting around within the water column. Normally at the top where the sunlight is, is where you'll find all your diatoms. Um, pinnate diatoms can form these elaborate chains like this Astronopolis here. Um, sometimes I will see them in my sample single cell and you know, I'll normally see the little triangle shape and the little spine, but they also make these beautiful patterns. And then the last one is a nichia, and that's very common if you participate in PMN. Those are navicula and nichia, or one of the two first um, ones that you learn to ID. Um, dinoflagellates. Now, that's a whole different group of phytoplankton. Um, they do photosensitize very similar to um, diatoms, but they also have a way to ingest um, nutrients. Um, it's a very complicated science. We won't go into that. But um, what's really, um, oh, what I want to share with you too is normally we associate dinoflagellates with um, the toxins, and a lot of them do cause um, some problems. But these two species on the screen do not. So these are not really doing anything harmful, but providing us oxygen and providing food for zooplankton to eat. Um, what's really unique about these things, if you've ever participated in a phytoplankton monitoring network, you will see them moving around on your slide. They're very, they have a fast movement on your slide and they're very hard to ID them. So I normally look at these and preserve samples so that I can ID them. They move with their flagellum. They have two. One is wrapped around the middle in the cingulum here, this little groove, and one, y'all are, your face is in front where I can point out, but on the bottom, um, they have a flagellum too. So you get, uh, uh, they have a kind of a twirling movement this way, and then they can also propulse their way back and forth kind of at the same time and they can be very challenging to ID a lot in live samples and PMN. Um, hey Paige, about one minute left. Oh, uh, HABs, um, these are some of our pictures we've taken um, at the GTM um, of some of the dinoflagellate HABs. Um, we, we are very fortunate we don't see these in large numbers to cause concerns. Um, a hab we have seen, a harmful algal bloom, is a diatom called ketoceros. And um, these do not release a toxin. They have little spines here. And this is a picture from 2016 that did cause um, some fish to die in Guana Lake. Um, if these spines get caught in the fish gills, they can cause them not to be able to survive. So this is one bloom we have seen at the GTM, and this is the only harmful bloom I've personally seen in seven years. Are all, harm, are all blooms harmful? Um, what I want to leave with you is a message that um, algae and phyto, phytoplankton, which is algae, is not all bad. This is a bloom that um, happened in Guana Lake this summer. And although you see a lot of them here, they're not causing problems. They can occur, occur naturally, and um, they're not always bad. So I think my time's up. I could say a lot more about phytoplankton. Um, I want to leave you with the message that phytoplankton are beautiful. They're wonderful for our environment. And this is a famous art artist and diatomist that I really look up to. And Caitlin can share you with you the four minute link of how he does his art. And some of you probably have seen, seen this picture before. So I will leave you with that. Although I have a lot more to say, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paige, and thank you, John, for such an exciting dive into the phytoplankton monitoring network at the reserve and some of the plankton species that are observed at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, and Paige, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, and Ashley, if you want to go ahead and get yours up while I introduce you. Um, Ashley Rayom is the GTM Research Reserve's Margaret A. Davidson Fellow. This fellowship provides students 
up to a two-year um, tuition, salary, and research funding to study key coastal management decisions in the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Ashley grew up in Michigan, but with many visits to the Florida Keys, she was inspired by marine sciences and today is a PhD student at the University of Central Florida, where she is studying ways that DNA can be used to monitor marine ecosystem health. So we are excited to welcome Ashley to our GTM Talks webinar series and hear more from you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, you can see my screen. Everything's good. Okay. Thank you. So um, as Caitlin said, my name is Ashley. I'm a PhD student at UCF and I am going to be talking about how I'm working to use DNA to assess the impact of water quality on plankton communities. So uh, first I'll give you guys just a little bit of a background about why I'm here um, and how I got here from Michigan. So I grew up in Michigan and I went to Central Michigan University for my undergraduate degree. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to work with the ocean. So I sought out some summer research opportunities and I had a lot of cool chances to work with everything from marine ecology to molecular biology. And um, I decided that I just couldn't choose. So I decided to go into the field of molecular ecology. And this is really cool because it uses microscopic novel DNA techniques to answer really broad questions about um, ecosystem functions. So I also knew that I wanted to um, be a part of conservation efforts and that my work in science and research was the best way for me to do this. So that's what led me to start my graduate program last year at the University of Central Florida and ultimately apply for this um, Margaret Davidson Fellowship. So as Kaylin mentioned, the Davidson Fellowship is a um, graduate program that awards funding to 29 graduate students at each of the 29 National Estuarine Research Reserves. And a key goal of the fellowship is to address a priority management need at that reserve. So here at the GTM, the management needs were to one, synthesize water quality and biological data, two, characterize spatial patterns, three, investigate indicators of ecological condition, and four, determine how to restore water quality. So that's a pretty big goal. That's a lot of questions, but it turns out that plankton monitoring can actually help us answer all of these questions. So why plankton? And Paige touched on this a bit, um, but I'll go into, over it again. So plankton are the base of the food web. And here in this image, um, this is a model marine ecosystem. And each of the gray dots shows the relative biomass of that species in the environment. So when you think of the ocean, you typically think of like those big animals like whales or sharks. You might even think about some of your sport fish or your shorebirds if you're into birding. Um, but as this illustration shows, it's really the microscopic life that supports the entire ecosystem. Um, we have the, the phytoplankton, which are the um, photosynthesizing organisms in the water, and then we have the zooplankton. And these are multicellular organisms um, that function a little bit more like animals. Um, they're pretty diverse, and some of them include uh, fish larvae. So not only do they provide a large amount of biomass, they're also um, critical to some of the cycling and chemical processes on Earth. So um, phytoplankton perform photosynthesis and they cycle carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. And then the zooplankton graze on this phytoplankton and they transfer the carbon throughout the trophic levels as they are eaten and they also transfer other nutrients to other animals and the environment. And because of this, plankton can be considered canaries in a coal mine when it comes to water quality. They respond very quickly to changes in the environment. So this graph here by Southers et al. shows on the y-axis the ecosystem trophic level. Um, so we start all the way down here with the phytoplankton and then go up to the fish. And then on the x-axis is the time that that organism is taking to vis visibly respond to a change in the environment. So we can see that phytoplankton and zooplankton here, they take only days to weeks to ch uh, respond to changes um, 
like changes in nutrients, salinity, temperature, while the fish community might not reflect this change um, for months or years. Um, and these things I listed here are just a few different things that plankton can tell resource managers about their water quality. The first is nutrients. So like I mentioned, they play key roles in nutrient cycles. Um, if there's too many nutrients from pollution or runoff, we might see those harmful algal blooms, um, which will decrease oxygen in the environment. Uh, plankton can also inform us if there are toxins or pathogens in the environment. Some of these are very sensitive to uh, very small amounts of toxins. And some plankton can actually carry pathogens. Like there are certain zooplankton that will harbor vibrio bacteria within their cell walls. They can also tell us about the turbidity or muddiness of the water as phytoplankton require sunlight to photosynthesize. And finally, the role that phytoplankton or and zooplankton play in carbon Carbon cycling allows us to learn more about the immediate effects of climate change and ocean acidification. And if those environmental impacts weren't enough to convince you that plankton are important, they also directly affect humans. Um, the tourism and recreation industries, especially here in Florida, um, rely on healthy, clean water. And if we see these harmful algal blooms, that can be just detrimental to the industry. Plankton are also used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, they're a great source of omega-3s and antioxidants and are used in some biomedical research. The fisheries and aquaculture industries rely on zooplankton, most, mostly krill, um, as a source to feed the fish that we eventually consume. And another interesting fact is that they can be used for pest control. So some zooplankton actually eat mosquito larvae and they are put in ponds as a form of biological pest control. So I have three major goals for my research here at the GTM over the next two years. And the first is to expand the current plankton surveys and the baseline data sets that um, all of our volunteers are working on. So you can, you can tell clearly from what Paige was explaining that Identifying and quantifying these plankton takes a lot of work and a lot of training. Um, so I hope here that I can expand this plankton monitoring to all of these sites that we do the monthly nutrient sampling on. And then use that information to investigate the relationships between water quality and plankton communities. In order to do this, I'm looking at developing a meta barcoding toolkit for more robust plankton monitoring. And this is a novel molecular technique for species identification that I'm going to go into a bit more detail. So when you check out at the grocery store, every item has a barcode. Uh, the barcodes all look pretty similar, but when they're scanned at the computer, the computer is able to tell that there's just enough difference in each barcode that you can tell which item you're buying. So this is the basic concept of DNA barcoding. Closely related organisms have similar sections of their DNA sequences that vary just enough that we can tell which species is which. Um, when we sequence the DNA in the lab and put them into the computer programs, it will match it up against the database and tell us what species we're looking at. Metabarcoding is pretty much the same, except it allows us to input multiple sequences of DNA and identify multiple species at the same time. So how do I do this? Well, first, all I have to do is scoop some water into a bottle. That's the easy part. And then I take it back to the lab and I use a vacuum pump to filter out all of the water and collect the plankton on a filter paper. Then I extract the DNA directly from this filter paper by putting it into a tube and chopping it up and then following a commercial DNA extraction kit. So it's always amazing to me how simple that DNA extraction can be. Um, lots of scientists have gotten it down to these kits where you just follow step-by-step -step instructions, add some chemicals, and then you have the DNA isolated and cleaned up ready for sequencing. So this next part is where it gets a little trickier. Um, I don't want to sequence the entire genomes of all of the animals um, in my sample because that would just be like an amazing amount of data. And it doesn't help that much for identification. I just want to sequence that small part that I mentioned before that is unique to each animal. So to do this, I have to add a primer. 
And this primer will attach to a region of the DNA that again is the same in each animal, but varies just enough. So that way when I sequence it and put it in the computer, it will match up to a database and tell me what species I'm looking at. So this is a process that has become more efficient and cost effective over the years. And it's really revolutionized the way that um, we can identify species. And some plankton are so difficult to tell apart through a microscope. Um, and sometimes even trained experts can't identify some of them. So I want to expand upon the work that our volunteers are doing in order to add more information to our data sets, um, increase the volume of water that we can sample and hopefully make it really efficient and easy for us to um, identify more species in the environment. So I just started my fellowship back in August and I'm currently uh, in the sample collection phase. I'm going to be collecting water from the GTM once per month over the course of a year. I'm going out with uh, some of the GTM staff on their monthly nutrient sampling runs and collecting my plankton with them. And then I bring it back to the lab and here's my filter setup. So I'm currently working on optimizing the DNA extraction and sequencing methods. Uh, the lab I work in does some similar research with fish, but I do have to do some trial and error to um, optimize this for plankton identification. And there are so many different types of diverse plankton out there that um, I just need to try a few different things and see uh, what works best to make this process feasible for managers to use in the future. Uh, finally, I can do some data analysis and some statistical tests to identify community trends. So in the end, I hope this data will help us um, get a better picture of the community composition of plankton and how it's changing over space and time, as well as in response to changes in the environment. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me out and who's um, given me funding to do this project. I'm really excited to be here for the next two years. Thank you so much, Ashley. And we are excited to have you for the next two years. Um, so we will now go ahead and head into our Q&A portion. And Brittany, do you have any questions in the chat box? Okay, so can you hear me okay? All right, so um, Catherine Halbert had a question about um, research that's been conducted between diatoms and water quality um, through uh, GTM specifically. And um, Nikki, our doctor, Nikki Dix, um, she included a response already. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Catherine. Um, aside from any other questions, let's see, Jeff Finnan um, has a question for Paige, and he said, when counting, are you doing it manually or is it done electronically? Okay, I am doing it manually, like um, per slide or in, I'll, I'll answer it for the uh, counting I'm doing for the research. So. Once I set my sample and I let it sit there for an hour per ml water because I'm quantifying it, then I go use the lawnmower technique where you go like this down the whole entire uh, slide or my settling chamber. And I use that counter and I'm counting each individual species. Um, and I tally them or I use the counter and each sample um, for research takes me anywhere from two to four hours to count one water sample. Um, I've gotten a little better through the years of being able to measure out um, with each site the, a better um, amount of the water sample and that alleviates some of my time because I, I know which sites are gonna be more dense with plankton versus not. And like Ashley said, <laughs> Even if you've done this for years, some of the species are so similar, you would, you need to wash out the cell and actually see um, what the silica leftover shell part is before you can ID them. So most of the identification that I do is to the genus level. And um, what she's doing with the DNA is going to be able to provide 
provide more um, information of the actual species. I hope that. Thank you, Paige. And thank you for that question, Jeff. Um, and then we have a question from Mike Allier. It's nice to know that you guys are still attending our lectures. Um, Mike's question is, is there interest in expanding the plankton surveys into the offshore waters that are included in the boundaries of GPM there? So. And it does look like Nikki just popped into the chat box for answering that. Perfect. So then, um, thank you, Nikki, for jumping in there. Um, and then, let's see, Irene says, is there any monitoring done on the ocean water here at GTM? So specifically ocean water, anyone? Maybe Paige or John? I think that that might have been the same question that Mike yeah. was getting I at. I think it's the same. Okay. Is it? Thank you. Further offshore? I do. Then we we do modern monitoring through, I think it's the Fish and Wildlife for the Hab Run at the GTM. I look, personally, I look at those samples, but it's not official stuff. But we do have, um, I think it's Fish and Wildlife that does the uh, Hab Run. Okay. And then we have a question from Sydney Williams for Ashley. Um, are your water samples collected in the same areas of the swamp monitoring stations? And are you focusing on any particular areas of the reserve? Yeah, so I go on the swamp runs and I collect at the same locations and then also where they do the DEP um, nutrient runs. Um, so that would be the guana river. I, I get the two mixed up. <laughs> the one in the north. Um, so I'm going out and sampling at the same site that they collect their nutrient samples at. Perfect. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, do we have any other questions for the chat box before we go to hand raised questions? I don't see any. So if, uh, if you would like to raise your um, virtual hand, you can navigate to the participants tab um, and there should be a raise hand option. So if you have any additional questions, uh, we have a few minutes here um, before we wrap up if you have any other questions you, and you, or you can um, unmute yourself. I did see a question way, way, way up in the chat box. And it, I think it's more of a fun question for John. And Nikki was wondering if you teach your friends and family about plankton. Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> uh, it's trying to find those that are interested. Now, Meredith in the photos is my wife. And so I've recruited her. And uh, so she would rather be out there with me than, you know, me going up there up to the right swing by myself and all that. But she's interested somewhat, but the answer, I guess, generally speaking, is no. <laughs> Can I ask the same question of Paige? Paige, how much does your family get involved in plankton work? Okay, a lot. <laughs> And um, when they get tired of hearing me, they send me to the GTM and um, they're missing that I can't go there anymore. <laughs> so they're the brunt of all my um, algae talk and um, they all know about phytoplankton at my house. And, and they have to stop what they're doing when I'm um, analyzing my samples and come over and look at my sample because I have to have somebody see something exciting. So yes, my family knows about phytoplankton, probably more than they wanted to know. 
Um, I have a quick question, um, I guess for everyone, for all, all of our presenters. Do you have a favorite species that you get really excited about every time you observe it? Do you want me to go? Ashley? Me? Um, diatoms. I love all diatoms. Um, they're just so beautiful and um, I, the costa and discus are just so classic, but they are beautiful, but there's so many of them. But diatoms definitely are my favorite. I'd have to say the dino flagellates or, or wine because they, there's a lot of movement in them. So they're not as easy to identify and they're, they're so much different, you know. We, we call those woodies because they're made out of uh, cellulose versus uh, silica for the diatom. So I find di uh, dinoflagellates very, very interesting. Um, I actually never even thought about working on plankton until I started this project. So I, I haven't had time to have a favorite yet, but I do think zooplankton and copepods are really interesting. They're one of the smallest animals. I do have another question. Um, I know that um, we're all kind of missing the reserve right now, but do you have a favorite sampling location that you guys go to uh, within the reserve boundaries? Whether it's in the north north region or the south region? You wanna answer that, Paige? I like Wright's Landing. Um, we see uh, uh, more diversity of plankton there for some reason. I'm not sure why. I, and I also um, have some personal um, PMN NOAA sites that I keep up, and one of them is in Salt Run, and I en enjoy um, that as well. And I don't really get to visit uh, the research samples. I just get the little bottles where they're at, but I do like Pelissier Creek. <laughs> My favorite is uh, Wright's Landing as well. Um, for two reasons. One is I like the location and it's very interesting. We do see a lot of boat traffic up and down the intercoastal waterway. But the other reason is uh, for a mile and a half um, traveling either in the golf cart or an ATV, you get to see some of this beautiful territory we call GTM. It's, it's old, old Florida that has never been developed as far as I know. And so it's what Florida used to look like. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, so I get to see a pretty cool like diversity in sampling sites in between the swamp run and then being up by the Guana River and Lake Nutrient Runs. Um, been in the airboat for my, for, for my first time, which was really cool, in the marsh. And then down at the swamp sites is like the intercoastal waterway, which is really neat. See the big like yachts and things like that. So <laughs> it's been fun. All right. Well, thank you to our wonderful presenters and thank you all for joining us today. Um, within the next week, we will send you an email with the link to view this webinar as well as a quick survey to let us know what you thought. And there were some really great resources shared in the chat box. So we will share those with you as well. Stay tuned to the Friends of the GTM Reserve website for future GTM Talks offerings. And we will go ahead and let anybody go who needs to go. And if you wanna stick around to chat a little bit, you're welcome to. But thank you all and stay well, and we'll see you next time.